Welcome to Growth Track. I'm Justine Moss, and thanks for your company. Growth Track is SGX's new podcast series where we focus on investment and growth opportunities across Asia by bringing together thought leaders from the global financial marketplace as well as politics and economics. We hope to promote greater understanding of the markets today and shape ideas for tomorrow. Today, we hear from two distinguished gentlemen who will share their thoughts on Asia's economic recovery in 2022. Also, the future of Singapore's role in that journey, how trust has evolved through COVID-19 and the impact this will have on industries in the region. Kwa Chong Seng was appointed chairman of the SGX board in September 2016 and previously spent many years in the oil industry. Joining Chong Seng is Kishore Mabubani, a distinguished fellow at the Asia Research Institute, National University of Singapore, and also former ambassador to the UN. Welcome, gentlemen. Hope you've had a wonderful start to 2022, Chong Seng. Yes, and an exciting time. We're in the middle of launching specs. I think, um, to show you know what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, the exchange is sort of a multi-asset exchange. So it's quite promising in terms of growth because the more volatility we see in the market, the more exciting it is for the exchange. And Kishore, how's your start to 2022 been? Well, I'm very excited to hear what Chong Seng just said <laughs> because my own reaction to 2022 is a bit confused. On the one hand, we seem to be coming out of this dark tunnel of COVID-19. And on the other hand, we also have this great uncertainty how the year will pan out. But I'm actually very happy to hear from Chong Seng that on the economic front, and this is what I'm also picking up Chong Seng, that activity is picking up in 2022. And I think what's happening in the stock exchange is obviously a reflection of that. And so I'm very happy to join this conversation. Wonderful to have you both. Chong Seng, let's just start with you then. What would you say is top of mind for you for 2022? Top of mind in terms of the economy really is inflation. I think we all know that the Federal Reserve and other central banks have been very accommodating in the way they've positioned their balance sheets. So we see a lot of liquidity in the markets. And because of that, we are going to have a fairly strong tail. And I mean, the issue really for us, well, really, the, I'm talking broadly macroeconomic issues around the world, is inflation. I think inflation is going to be a concern, but at the same time, there's so much liquidity in the market that it's got, it'll probably have a long tail and it'll take a while before all that liquidity is whittled away. So we're hopeful. I agree with you, Kishaw. The concerns that everybody has are well-founded because we've gone through this dark tunnel as Kishaw was talking about. But Kishaw, don't, don't you see the sort of light at the end of the tunnel? <laughs> Well, I do actually see quite a bit of light at the end of the tunnel, partly also because, you know, my field is geopolitics, yours is more economics. And on the geopolitical front, clearly the big thing that is happening is the US-China contest. There's no doubt that it will pick up momentum in the 2020s. And of course, as in any geopolitical contest, there are dangers. But what I want to talk more about actually are the opportunities that are being provided by this geopolitical contest. So, for example, when we are talking about good news, one thing that people haven't noticed is that 2022 has begun with a big bang. And that big bang is the launch of the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, which is the world's largest free trade agreement among the 10 ASEAN countries, China, Japan, South Korea, Australia, and New Zealand. And what is stunning about this free trade agreement that people haven't noticed is that actually under this big umbrella of RCEP that ASEAN created, Three of the largest and most significant economies, China, a $15 trillion economy, Japan, about $5 trillion economy, South Korea, about $1.6, $1.8 trillion economy. You add that out, it's larger than the U.S. economy. And these three economies have effectively created a free trade agreement among themselves starting January 1st, 2022. And already you're seeing the effects of that. Those tariff reductions are going to give an economic boost to Northeast Asia and to Southeast Asia. So all these positive developments, I think we need, also need to factor in when we are also watching the bad news. No, I agree with that. I think the only issue really is the TPP, you know, which was supposed to be kicked off and obviously it's not going to happen, at least not in that whole form. The US is out mm -hmm. and the US is out of our set. 
So how will that play out? I mean, now you have China and Taiwan and South Korea applying to be members of RCEP. And then I wonder, no, I'm sorry, or the, or the TPP, TPP yeah. or the stepped down version of the TPP. Yeah. So the question that I have is really, how is that all going to play out? Well, actually, that's a very good point you raised because, well, yeah, as you said, the new variation of TPP, CPTPP, <laughs> lots of acronyms. Yes. And the stunning thing is that it used to be the United States. As you know, Johnson, you and yes. I both spent many years in the United that's States, right. okay? You're with Exxon. I spent 10 years as ambassador the UN. to the UN. So I know New York. New York's my second home. And when I first went to the United States in the mid-80s, United States was the great champion of free trade. And in fact, I was present when, unusually for Asian leader, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew was invited to address a joint session of Congress in 1985, in which he thanked the United States of America for promoting free trade in the world. He said the free trade you promoted has generated this tremendous economic growth in East Asia. Thank you very much, United States of America. That's 1985. Mm. But today, the remarkable change in the world is that the U.S. Congress has become so anti-free trade that the U.S. is incapable of signing and, free and trade. And both sides of the aisle. Both sides of the aisle. So, the so regardless of which administration comes in. Exactly. You know, when you, you and I were there, the Republicans were the free traders. Yes. Right. <laughs> and they were our good friends. <laughs> And certainly we in Singapore, we are not so concerned about who writes the rules, but we want to have more free trade. But you were talking earlier about RCEP, and I wonder how RCEP is going to fit in with this other CPTT, what do you call it? CPTPP. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you know what I mean. Yeah. Without China, without the US, we have basically yeah. ASEAN and Japan led. And I yeah. actually think that ASEAN is in a good place over the coming years because yeah. ASEAN by itself, I believe, at some point is going to be the fourth or fifth largest economy in the world, getting close to the EU. Exactly. As you know, trade is not a zero-sum game. Yes. Trade is a positive-sum game. So both RCEP and CPTPP will both generate additional trade. And additional trade means more money for businessmen. More money for businessmen means they invest more. You, you, you and they don't trade think the two more. trade agreements are in conflict. You think they, they can uh, They will reinforce each other. And many countries are members of both. Japan is a member of both. Yes. Singapore is a member of both. Australia and New Zealand are members of both. So it is actually a positive sum game. But your point about ASEAN is very important, Chong Sing. Because one of the least known facts in the world about ASEAN is that in the year 2000, Japan's economy was eight times the size of ASEAN. Eight mm. times, okay. But by 2020, Japan's economy is only 1.5 times larger than ASEAN. And by 2030, as you said, ASEAN's economy will become Japan. bigger than Japan's. Exactly. So this is the thing about the region that mm. I think people outside are not aware of, that in many ways, the ASEAN region, fortunately, partly because of geography. Demographic. And it's also I mean, this is the young population that's geography, growing, and, you know, yeah. Japan and China, in terms of population, are going to decline. That's right, decline. You know, so that's going to have a big swing over time. Yeah, and ASEAN is going to be the biggest beneficiary of all these trade explosions that we are seeing, the combination of RCEP and CPT. TPP, and of course, other developments. So on the business front, just as China has already produced the world's largest middle class, ASEAN is on its way to producing a very large middle class. This was about 40 million in 2000, and I think it's about 130 million now. You will hit 300 million. Hey, you hit 300 million. That's the population of the United States. Gentlemen, can I just continue with the ASEAN theme thread, but just ask what you think of Singapore's role in all of this about the economy rebounding faster, perhaps in other parts of the world, and how we can actually serve as that node to connecting the world's investors to Asia here. Chong Seng, why don't you go first? Well, Singapore's in the middle of ASEAN, literally. In fact, uh, we've always been an entrepreneur for, you know, if you go back 50 years. So it's a center of trade. So from a trade perspective, I think what Kisho is talking about certainly will be very positive. And then from an exchange perspective, sorry to get into a little bit more exchange business, we really hope to see the exchanges in ASEAN trying to get together to make perhaps uh, trade more. 
and therefore that will uh, increase liquidity and increase flow in the region. Mm. And Kishore, what about Singapore's role here in ASEAN and what is exciting you perhaps about Singapore's role? Yeah, when I was dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, we set up something called the Asian Competitiveness Institute. And that ACI, Asian Competitiveness Institute, did some studies on which factors drive Singapore's economic growth annually. And it's actually our neighbors, our correlation with our neighbors' growth is very, very high. So with Malaysia and Indonesia and of ASEAN, of course. So when ASEAN does well, Singapore does very well. So Singapore is actually, and that's why, as you know, this is, I'm giving away a big national secret here. <laughs> why we, Singapore has been the one pushing all these free trade agreements because Singapore's economy is the only economy in the world where the total trade is three to three and a half mm. times the size of its GNP. No other country in the world. But do you still see trade barriers within ASEAN? You think that will slowly... Uh... Yeah, most of the tariff barriers have come down. Mm. In fact, the tariff barriers have been eliminated by the ASEAN free trade area and then reinforced by RCEP mm. and other things. But of course, there are non-trade barriers, non-tariff barriers that are actually more difficult to overcome. But one thing good that ASEAN has done is promote what they call trade facilitation measures. And trade facilitation for businessmen actually sometimes is more important. It's not the tariff. It's how you get past your customs. You don't think the politics will get in the way because really, as we all know, it's not a political union. Yeah. And there are obviously pros and cons because if you look at the EU, while it's been strong, at the same time, there are divisive tensions. You kind of wonder, have we found the right formula and how will ASEAN develop over time? Yeah, that's a good question. And, and I think at the heart of your question is the level of trust among the ASEAN countries. And here, the one thing I can say, when I joined the Singapore Foreign Ministry in 1971, and I, when I attended my first ASEAN meeting, you walked into a room full of distrust. Of course, the Malaysians, can you yes. imagine that that separated from Singapore? Indonesia contra Tasi against yeah. Malaysia and Singapore. Philippines claimed the Malaysian state. Thailand and Malaysia were quarreling over separatists mm -hmm. in Patani. So you can imagine there's a lot of distrust. But what's happened in the past 50 years is that the distrust has eroded. And I can tell you, recently I did a one-on-one -on -one interview with President Jokowi of Indonesia. Mm -hmm. And I actually spent some time with him even before he became president. And he's a very pragmatic president who only wants to promote economic growth of Indonesia. And he understands that economic growth and cooperation is a positive sum game. Right. President Jokowi is a huge asset for the yeah. region. Except, you know, elections are coming and this is all one term. And so, but anyway, these trends are real. Yeah. But would you say that another factor, perhaps on the negative side, has been that this geopolitical tensions we talk about between the US and China, that to some extent brings ASEAN together? Well, there are conflicting tendencies. But one thing constant among all the 10 ASEAN countries, because some of the ASEAN countries are closer to China, like Cambodia and Laos. Some are closer to the United States, like Vietnam. Well, we all want to be neutral. We all but, want to be friends with everybody. all 10 want to be neutral. All 10 are saying we want to be friends with the United States and we want to be friends with China and don't ask us to choose. And frankly, the one leader who's been very brave in saying this very openly is the Prime Minister of Singapore. Lee Hsien Loong has said it both at a speech he gave at the Shangri-La Dialogue yes. and in a foreign affairs article. So he's been very brave. But what was said by the Prime Minister of Singapore is actually you can feel in the hearts of all the Southeast Asian leaders. Mm -hmm. Don't make us choose. We want to be friends with both. Well, let's leave ASEAN just for a minute, gentlemen. But very interesting thoughts there, of course, from the both of you. Let's talk about China and India in a little bit more depth about their economies and how 2022 is shaping up for China and India. Chong Singh? Well, we can't move through, through this geopolitical scene without talking about COVID. I mean, COVID's been a factor all around. China obviously has been growing, if you look at the last 10 years, faster than anybody else. The issue is really the zero COVID policy and whether that can prevail. Because if that continues, I think it will crimp China's growth. India, as we all know, is the world's largest democracy and that's good and bad. And of course, the demographics are clearly in India's favor because we all know that at some point in time, the population in India is going to be bigger than China. Then you kind of say, we in ASEAN, 
between these two very big countries, very big economies. Over time, we will find our own place and we will do well as a meeting point, hopefully, and a way to facilitate trade. And many of these things will come. But we all, as Tisha has just been talking about, are all concerned about these tensions and whether that can be dissipated by time. I'm actually optimistic on both China and India, oh, but for different reasons. In the case of China, someone said this to me quite remarkably, very nicely. He said China has stopped producing babies, but China hasn't stopped producing brains. And China today, it's, it's this statistic, um, I hope the listeners will verify, China is producing 9 million graduates a year. That's larger than the rest of the world combined. That's an amazing statistic, okay? So the population is not growing, but the number of educated population and therefore entering the middle class is growing. And China's retail goods market in the year 2009 was $1.8 trillion. Mm. And United States was $4 trillion, more than double that. No, of, I agree. Yeah. I think the trajectory that China was on was really a very strong trajectory. My question is really... Will COVID or the zero COVID policy that China have crimp China's growth? You're absolutely right. That's why the year 2022 is a very difficult year to figure out. Because actually, we I was expecting China to gradually come out of its zero COVID policy. But I think it will be very difficult because Omicron is spreading very, yes. very fast. And there's a limit to what your hospital capacity can be if it spreads too fast. So I'm not so sure. But so therefore, on the year 2022, maybe a difficult year for COVID. But I think we will come over the hump. And I think post-COVID, China will bounce back. And I think India will also bounce back. And in India's case, the demographics are very, very good. And the Indians also benefit from the fact that the overseas Indian community, as you know, especially in the United yes. States, has done remarkably well. Several CEOs. Yeah, yeah. And Satya Nadella of uh, Microsoft, Sundar Pichai of yes. Google, and formerly Indra Nuyi, I'm sure, yes. of PepsiCo, whom you yeah. must know. So it's amazing. So on both China and India, I think this will be the two big growth engines of Asia. Mm. And talking about business leaders, gentlemen, what do you think they need to do more of in 2022 and perhaps lessons that they've learned from last year? Chong Singh? We're talking about global business leaders. I think Kishore was just talking about trade, and I think that's very important. But unfortunately, you have to, as a political leader, satisfy your base constituency first. So the issue is, as we know, many of the democratic countries are divided because you have uh, very politicized electorates. And the issue is, how do you avoid these populist tendencies? Because these populist tendencies tend to end up playing to the base, which may not be in the interest of the country. And I wonder what's the future of democracy and how that can fit in. I mean, in Singapore, we have always been accused of not being the most pure democracy, <laughs> but perhaps that path has served us well. Yeah, I completely agree with you that business leaders have to be sensitive to the political trends. And as you know, especially American CEOs are very troubled by the US-China tensions because they have to do business in China, with China, and they have to worry about the political backlash. As you know, Elon Musk yes. just got slapped left, right, and center for setting up a Tesla showroom in uh, Xinjiang. And but in satellites, and in satellites was That's a right. uh, dominating uh, space. Exactly. But one interesting point here, I'm going to go back to your very first point you made, Chong Singh, when you spoke about inflation. And I know that people in Washington, D.C. are very, very worried about inflation. And I think President Biden also knows that if inflation gets bad, then he's in deep trouble for the November 2022 midterm elections. Yes. And he has very few policy instruments he can use. But surprisingly, one policy instrument he can use to fight inflation is to remove tariffs on Chinese products. Because mm. as you know, the Chinese produce cheap products yes. that have actually expanded explained why the American middle class has been improving its lifestyle, even though its income hasn't been growing up. And it's China's a, production has been a major deflationary factor. There's such an anti-China consensus among the, the <laughs> exactly. base. And that's something I was talking about, these populist tendencies. And I don't know if you agree, but to some extent, the internet has really caused 
in my mind, this populist tendencies where people tend to choose sides and they read only what they believe mm. and they reinforce themselves and they get more and more entrenched. Mm. And, and I wonder how can we come to a more common middle ground to better understand real issues that will improve our lives? Well, you put your finger on something very important. In fact, one key reason why there's been so much polarization in the United States is that in the past, everybody would read the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and they would disagree, but at least people would read the same newspapers and get the same news. But now you have two big echo chambers. And the Democrats just go to their own social media channels. The Republicans go to their own social media channels. And they get not just different views, they get different facts. <laughs> I mean, like, for example, did, was the United States Congress, was there an insurrection on January 6th? The Democrats say, yes, there was an insurrection. Republicans say, no insurrection. So if you don't agree on the facts, how can yes. you talk? <laughs> yes. So the, you're right. That's a very critical thing, which is why I see, frankly, countries like Singapore and other Asian countries are very, very conservative about loosening up the social media platforms too much because they can be a very divisive and polarizing factor. It's very difficult to really regulate social media. I think everybody's concerned about that. But in my mind, from what I see, it's only increasing mm -hmm. rather than decreasing. So now we're talking about the metaverse, which is will be even more immersive. <laughs> now we go on WhatsApp and we can have group chats. But in the future, our avatars will be talking to each other. My goodness. <laughs> So lots of food for thought for business leaders in 2022. Another one that we must touch on, gentlemen, is sustainability. It's vaulted up the agenda, of course, during the pandemic, yet Asia accounts for close to half of the world's CO2 emissions. How do you think we can step up in 2022, Kishore? Well, I would say, to be fair, climate change is happening, not just because of the current flows of greenhouse gas emissions from Asian countries. It's also happening because of the stock of greenhouse gas emissions that have been put up by the Western industrialized countries since the Industrial Revolution. So if you look at it cumulatively, the total contribution of the countries to the greenhouse gas emissions on a stock basis, United States 25%. European Union, 22%. China, only 13%. India, only 3%. So you're blaming the countries that have only contributed 13% and 3% instead of the countries that have contributed 25% and 22%. So that's going to be a bit more fairness in the discussion here. But the good news is that China and India are not abdicating their responsibilities. And as you saw in the latest Glasgow talks, both countries have committed to peak emissions, and then eventually zero emissions, which is actually, these are actually major commitments that both China and India have made. And I'm impressed by that. But the Western industrialized countries can help in a big way. And you, you know, understand the oil industry very well, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have a simple carbon tax, that will make a big difference in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. I don't know, what do you think, Chong Seng, I mean, about the carbon tax? I agree tax? with that. I've been a supporter of the carbon tax for a long time. Ah, good. But you know, you talk about the US and gasoline is not taxed in the US. So obviously, if you start putting a tax on it, that will help. And Just one dollar a gallon will do, right? Oh, I mean, we pay more than that here in yeah. Singapore. <laughs> so let me say a couple of things on this. First, I believe it's the real issue and it needs to be solved. Mm. Second, I believe it can be solved because I think we need to first think about economic growth, which is important to everybody, including to the advanced economies and more importantly to the emerging economies mm -hmm. because they want to raise themselves out of poverty. They want electricity. They want clean water. They want a good life. So energy continues to be important. The question is how do you do it without generating so much CO2? You have to look at alternate sources of energy, and I think we're not doing enough of that. We've obviously looked at wind and solar and things like that, but we really need to look at nuclear too, because it's something that most people avoid, because you have had problems in the past, Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, Fukushima. People get nervous about it, but technology can solve that. You can go to smaller pebble bed reactors. You can go to other ways to generate nuclear power. Of course, the science maybe isn't quite there yet, and science over time will solve these issues. But I don't think you can go about trying to just simply say, stop all fossil fuel. Because when you do that, and if there's no alternate, look what's happened today. The price of oil is going up. 
mm-hmm. because nobody's drilling. One are the days where Wall Street was willing to finance oil companies and what happens is they all stop drilling and you have a very perverse effect. Yeah, you know, I agree. I think talking about $100 oil. Wow. Yes. $100 oil. Yes. Well, it's already stunning. 80, 81, 82 now. Yeah. It's not so far away. Yeah. So long-term approach, Kishore? A long, yeah, I think. And, 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 you know, to, to your point earlier about inflation in the US that mm. Biden's looking at, a lot of it is in the oil prices. Wow. Yeah. Because gasoline prices are $4 mm. more in the US now. Yeah, which is why many of the American more cynical commentators were saying in Glasgow, the Biden administration was saying, cut down your oil production. And then two months later, Saudi Arabia gets a call from Washington, D.C. Yes. Please raise your oil yes. production. <laughs> They talk about this OPEC move to try and increase production and the recent production increase was like 400,000 barrels. And the issue is that most of the OPEC countries are already tapped out. They don't have any more spare capacity, including Russia. So the only ones with spare capacity right now is Saudi Arabia and the Emirates. Wow, I didn't know that. So even this increased production that they're calling for, we're not going to see it. Yeah. Mm. What would you say to that, Kishore, then, in terms of your idea for long-term strategy? Well, I think all these issues show the need for greater global cooperation. And that's why, actually, the G20 meeting, G20 meetings are very important. This year, as you know, Indonesia is the chair of G20. And I'm sort of hopeful that Indonesia, because the advantage that Indonesia has is that it's trusted by both sides. It's trusted by United States. It's trusted by China. It's trusted by Europe. So I hope that Indonesia can play a bridging role and try to persuade everyone that when it comes to issues like climate change, mm. like energy shortages and so on and so forth. Actually, it's easier to solve them if there's greater global cooperation than trying to solve them nationally because you can't no, no, You're right. Because you need a lot of investment. So I was talking about nuclear. I think the issue is really you need to do it at scale. You can't just do solar panels because that's just not going to cut it. Mm. So the other thing that you can do on scale, of course, you need technology and a lot of money is carbon sequestration because mm. there is technology now that you can capture carbon and re-inject it into the ground and sequester it. The issue is it's going to cost a lot of money. Mm. And then this global cooperation that you talk about is necessary because you need to do R&D and you need to finance mm. all this. Mm. Yeah. Gentlemen, another topic I'd like to get your thoughts on is actually last year and the year before has seen the way that corporations and their employees work and how we all address each workday differently and how we've had to adjust, adapt. What does the future of work look like, Chong Seng? It's going to be different. I think clearly we have hybrid now, which is some people work from office, some people from home, but I've obviously done both. Working from home has got a lot of advantages. You don't have to commute. You don't have to change your clothes even sometimes. I guess you just put on a shirt and you do a Zoom call. But the issue really is in the ideation process in trying to create and talk to your fellow colleagues about what you think about this idea and trying to bring some innovation and synergy. And so it's important. So we have to find some new ways of being able to allow people to work from home when they need to, but at the same time, we shouldn't slow down the ability to create and to innovate and build new work processes. Mm. Kishore? I completely agree with Chong Seng. And actually, I'm surprised at how productive I have been in my house just wearing a shirt. (laughs) I never stand up in a Zoom call. (laughs) It's amazing how you can get a lot of work done in the house. But at the same time, we human beings, we are social animals. And we just need to be around other of our own social animals just to get the kind of creativity, the kind of sparks, the kind of ideas, and as you mentioned earlier. And so I suspect we're going to live in a hybrid workplace from now on. Wish list for 2022. Let's talk about that. We're just in January, but perhaps share with us your thoughts about what's on your wish list. Yeah, well, I think clearly we all would like to see some kind of, I mean, I'm talking, start with a very big global perspective, some kind of deton so that we have less tensions in the world. But from a more narrow perspective for the exchange, I really hope that we can use this year to become more of a 
the linkage trade market for Asia, as, as you know, we just don't do equities. We do many other products, which you will talk about in the other podcast. But we are very hopeful of the future. Mm, that's lovely. That's good to hear. Kishore. Well, I share the, your first wish on the global scale. So some kind of detente, as you said, between the United States and China, just to tone down the rhetoric. The competition will continue. Well, at least have it managed competition rather than sort of out of bounds, dangerous competition, which can happen within the two of them. But in the case of Singapore, I think what I would, my wish for Singapore and for Singaporeans is very simple. Please cheer up. Singapore is that to gripe and complain and see always the glass half empty. But of all the countries in the world, and I've said this in the, my latest book, Can Singapore Survive? Of all the countries in the world that have dealt with COVID-19, Singapore is clearly one of the best. And statistics show this. I mean, your chances of dying from COVID-19 anywhere in the world is probably the lowest in Singapore. That's amazing, okay? Now, can you imagine you're living in one of the safest places in the world? Cheer up. You know, there are difficulties, there are challenges. But we have overcome this challenge better than most societies have. And it shows the potential of Singapore. And so I hope that Singaporeans, when they look ahead at 2022, will feel more optimistic rather than pessimistic. Mm-hmm. I, I would add, that, I mean, first I agree with you, Kishore, but I would add that it's not just handling the pain that comes from COVID, people dying. But I think we've reached the right balance in terms of trying to open up Mm. because we can't shut down. I mean, Singapore is a very open economy. So we've been able to keep our hospitalization rates down, our incidence down, our fatality rates down. And yet we have been trying to open up more and more into the world. Mm. And I think this will continue. There's a lot of hope that Omicron will be the last, or at least one of the last uh, strains, variants, because it's obviously less serious. I mean, I'm sure you know people who have got Omicron, and so do I. And it's really not very serious. But we all need to be careful about COVID. I certainly don't want to catch it. But at the same time, I think if I caught it, I don't think I'll be too distressed. Hmm. And Kishore, just with what Chong Seng was saying about the growth prospects, do you agree? Oh, yes, definitely. I would say the growth prospects for this region are very good in the next 10 years because there have been a lot of wise policies, investments in education, investments in infrastructure. And after some time, these all these investments pay off significantly. We've seen that in the case of Singapore, and you'll certainly see that in the case of China. All these investments in physical and human infrastructure is just amazing. And that will also lead to payoffs. So the 2020s may turn out to be one of the better decades of human history. Chong Seng, closing thoughts on that? No, I certainly agree with you, Shaw. I think, well, I may be, perhaps I'm an optimist at heart, but I really think there's a lot that we should look forward to. We need to get over this dark tunnel, as Kishore calls it. But I see light at the end of the tunnel. The issue is how do we deal with all the changes? And we've been talking about that. I think the different styles of working, the hybrid, and the ability to integrate many of these issues. You've been listening to episode one of SGX's new thought leadership podcast series, Growth Track, where we focus on investment and growth opportunities across Asia. This episode featured Kwa Chong Seng, chairman of the SGX board, and Kishore Mabubani, a distinguished fellow at the Asia Research Institute, National University of Singapore. Thank you both so much, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Justine Moss, and thank you for listening. 